Good morning, beautiful people. We are so glad you guys are here with us today. We cannot wait to lead you in worship. So would you join us in standing and singing with us? Sin. 
friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh. the Dort travel team. Um, you probably haven't seen us here on campus leading worship because we have gotten the opportunity to lead worship to churches and schools in the area and that has been our jam for the past year. But we are so excited to be here with you this morning. First Peter 2, four through 10 reads, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into spiritual houses to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the ones who trust in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, this stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.
thank you for this day and for our place in it. God, thank you for this time just to worship and praise you as a congregation. Lord, help us to remember that during the hustle and bustle of daily life, that our time together and our time with you is ultimately what matters most. It's your love and strength that keeps us going, not our own. As we face the last few weeks of college, please help us carve out time in our busy schedules for fellowship to encourage one another and point one another toward you. Help us to value our brothers and sisters in Christ and to see our need for one another. We can't do it alone. Thank you for making us one family under you. We love you, Lord. Amen. On the sixth day, the Creator's voice speaks newness once again into the primordial void. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And as in days prior, out of nothing, stars, planets, and now life emerges from the imagination of pure love, the triune community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They place him in a perfect, sinless garden. But quickly observe that even there, it is not good for man to be alone. And in those simple words, Truth himself articulated a profound and fundamental reality that we were never meant to be alone. We were made to belong. Just as we open up, I um, just want to ask you guys if you'd join me just in showing some appreciation for so many Sundays you guys have gone out, represented us, and served the local church. Um, and done all you can in order to do that, and given up a day that would have been a day of rest to serve others. So will you just join me in thanking these guys for doing that? Will you please pray with me? Lord God in heaven, speak. Your servants are listening. Amen. For hundreds of years, you could have walked into any community, probably anywhere in the entire Western world, and what you would have seen was a town or a city organized around the church that would have been at the very center of it all. I was a couple weekends ago in Dubuque and then across the river into um, Galena in Illinois. And in both places, the one thing you noticed as soon as you came into the old downtown core was the towering steeples of the church that punctuated the skyline and would have been for so long the center of gathering, the center of people's social relationships, the center of their spiritual formation, the center of learning within a community, just flat out the center. In the mid to late 20th century, so much of that changed in many of our towns and cities where geographically, if we would have had Google Earth already back then, You'd be able to look down and be able to see that at the center of most communities would no longer have been a church, but would have been a shopping mall. Some sort of declaration of our actual allegiances or deepest values that were changing. In the 21st century, I think the center of what so much of social life gets revolved around is no longer the church and it's no longer the central center of commerce or retail, but rather a cell phone. These are seismic paradigm shifts that have had an incredible influence on the church and its role in society and its role in our lives. And right now, so much is being written. I have an entire sh shelf this long on my, in my, on my library, in my office, of all books dedicated in this new cottage industry, writing about all the decline that is happening in the church, about why people are leaving and why each successive generation is leaving at a higher percentage and at a faster rate than the ones that have gone before. And the barstool prophets and prognosticators and cultural commentators keep coming forward, adding all of their reasons and rationale for why this is taking place. And yet at the same time, on a global picture, the church continues to actually grow numerically. We're experiencing decline in our part of the world, but in so many others, it's growing at incredible rates. God's promise to build his church and that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it is still true. It is still active, and it is still taking place all around us. 
In fact, um, countries with the fastest Christian growth as a percent of their population, according to Within Reach Global, um, right now in the world, the fastest Christian growth by percent of their population, Iran, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia. These are the places where Christianity is growing the fastest right now. Interestingly, often many of those places are not friendly places to be a Christian. Now, on the flip side of all of this, here's the difficult news. The countries with the greatest decline as a percentage of their population who are Christians, according to Pew Research, is estimated that between 2010 and 2050, based on the trajectories that we are currently on, the number one country in the world that will experience the greatest decline as a percentage of its population being Christian is the United States of America. If our trajectory continues, that is where we will be. Now, I think there's a sense already in the church that so much of this is happening. And there's measures being taken, and so often we're coming up with different ideas on how do we do this? How do we hold on to something that feels like sand at times slipping through our fingers? And so often what we end up doing in moments of panic is reaching for the wrong levers or some of the things that are actually not going to help us or aren't really the biblical methods that God has given us for the growth and propagation of the church. One of the things that was most striking to me that I came across was some new research being done that was published in the Sociology of Religion Journal. And it talked about these countries with the fastest decline, and it was this comprehensive study that was done throughout 166, 166 countries. This is where they came down. In our statistical analysis of a global sample of 166 countries from 2010 to 2020, we find the most important determinant of Christian vitality is the extent to which governments give official support to Christianity through their laws and policies. However, it is not in the way devout believers might expect. As government support for Christianity increases, the number of Christians declines significantly. I find this so fascinating because there's this larger cultural conversation, especially right now as Christianity relates to politics in this country, with the belief that if we can just fix kind of the friendliness, the, the religious freedom components, the allowance that our government gives for Christians and for the space of Christianity, or even a reflection of Christian morals and laws in the policies and laws that get made in this land, then, then, then Christianity would be protected, then the church can grow. But what's so interesting is that in all of this study and research, the actual opposite is true. See, God has designed the gospel, and God has designed his church to not be conditional upon how friendly its environment is in order for it to grow. Christianity is not in need of power. Christianity is dependent upon its level of influence. And influence does not require being cozied up to any political monarch or president or prime minister or power because God built the gospel to be able to thrive in any environment, in any context, at any time in all of history, anywhere in the globe. That is one of the most important parts of the gospel and how he's put it together. In fact, Tertullian, already in the fourth century, one of the early church fathers, had this famous quote talking about the fact that blood is the seed of Christianity as he looked out across the world and saw persecution starting to ramp up. The statistics today prove this out as well. Some of the countries with the fastest growth in Christianity are places that are the most hostile to it. We are not dependent upon the friendliness of any government. It might sound like a nice thing, right, to be able to have certain freedoms and allowances from your government to exercise your religion. But the church is not built to be dependent upon that. And our ability to thrive and our ability to grow and our ability to expand and see the kingdom's reach continue to move further and further and further is only dependent upon the church's fidelity to Christ and his mission and the inbreaking of his kingdom. And so it doesn't matter whether it's raining or the sun is shining. It doesn't matter whether there's war or famine. It doesn't matter who sits in any political office. The gospel is not built to thrive based on any of those measures. 
It's built to thrive on the vitality of the Christ in you and in me. So often when things seem to be changing around us, our tendency is to point outward and to look and to blame and say the problem is out there and it's with them. But I think it's time for the church to ask some really hard questions about itself and for us to ask some really hard questions to ourselves. But if the church is not growing, not what does that say about the world around us, because that's not what God built the gospel to be dependent upon. The question that needs to be asked is, what's happening within us? Not why is the darkness so dark, but why is the light not shining any brighter? See, we were built for this. The gospel is built for any situation at any time. Because the church was built not merely to be an organization, but more like an organism. And the problem isn't out there at times when this is happening. It's about our fidelity to the gospel. It's about our ability to reflect the love of Christ to the world. And the church is never just a collection of ideas. It's a collection of people. And the only vehicle that was made to carry the Holy Spirit was the human heart. And the human heart is formed in God's designed furnace of transformation, which is his church. But friends, you were made to belong within the church. And as our churches live out their calling well, and as we spur one another on to growth and to boldness and to a greater fidelity to the scriptures, then the strength of the Christian influence in the world increases. No other reason. Now, there might be one other intangible, and sometimes the Holy Spirit's just got something in mind in a certain place at a certain time, and a revival breaks out, or he does something. And so it's not just a formulaic thing. Please hear me well. But I think that is the greatest condition on whether or not you and I are growing, and if we're growing with all the people around us at the same time. I'm going to read back through the passage that was read on the screen earlier from 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10, because I think this talks about what the church is and what it's supposed to do. And what I want you to do as we read through this text now is to find your place in it, right? Peter's writing to the diaspora. There's Christians all over the Roman world at this time, many who found themselves to be minorities in the context that they were in, many who found themselves to be in difficult places. And so this is supposed to be encouragement, identity shaping, and a mission. So hear this now again. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I just want to point out a couple of things specifically in this text and the way that it's constructed that I think tells us a lot about how it is that we're supposed to live communally in discipleship as the church. The first comes in the opening line, and I love the way this is constructed. So many times, there's so much of the gospel that just simply is spoken in the grammar of a text itself. As you come to him, you are being built. As you come to him. I think there's this faulty idea that the Christian witness is dependent upon the perfection level of the discipleship within us. Our witness is actually predicated upon us growing and stumbling and falling and growing and stumbling and two steps forward and falling over and getting up and going on. And God's woven this beautiful element of revealing our sin to us, forgiveness, picking us up, empowering us along. 
our Christian witness is not to be able to go to the world and say, hey, we got everything figured out and we're actually living better than the, all of you guys are. It's I'm a sinner and I found salvation and I would love to tell you about that story and invite you into it. The process of the discipleship and not the perfection of it is part of our witness. You're allowed to say, I'm sorry I wronged you. You're allowed to say, please forgive me. This is Christian vocabulary. And in and of itself is part of our witness. To be able to say to the world, I'm not better than you. I just know where a Savior is that can be found. That's part of it. As you come to him, you are being built. This is like present tense, active language. It's happening as we speak. It's in the day-to-day -day stuff. And the best part, not as you come to him, you are building. As you come to him, you are being built. It's being done for you. That's the grace in the text. All you have to be doing is putting one foot in front of the other, trying to get closer and closer through the process of your life to the person and the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as those steps happen, he builds the rest. The closer you become in your walk with the Lord, the more fruit starts to be produced simply in our lives. Because we become a more effective vehicle collectively as the church for the gospel to work its way out through us. It is a work that God is doing. The second thing in this text, as you come to him, the living stone, you also, like living stones, are being built. Do not let it be lost on you that it is Peter, whose name is the rock, who's writing this language right now. Peter's got a little bit of familiarity with the idea of rocks and stones. I guess you would when you're named after it. But Peter could have said in this text, you also, like bricks, are being built. But bricks are uniform. And you're unique. So I think stones was the language you chose here for a very particular reason. Because what the world needs, what the church needs, is you and the unique packaging of personality and gifts that God has put together in you. Living stones. It's oxymoronic. A stone doesn't breathe. It doesn't have a heartbeat. But when put together and when shaped in God's hands, even stones can become living things in Peter's metaphor. So even when you think you might not be the most alive, in God's hands you are. You might not see it and the evil one might be lying to you all about it on a regular basis. But you are being built, even now. I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories from alum, alumni who said, um, I always sat in the back, and I probably looked like I was never listening, and, but what was happening inside of me didn't find its fruit or didn't bear until years later. You are being built. Put yourself in the spaces where even you don't feel things right away. Change is happening inside of you. Sometimes we go to church on a Sunday morning, and it's not about whether or not you like the sermon. Sometimes the greatest spiritual exercise is to go to church, to be in a place, to hear a sermon that had nothing to do with you, so for 20 minutes you can learn how to deny yourself and be excited for somebody else who is receiving. That is a deeply spiritual exercise. When I first moved to this community 20 years ago, I met a young man, and he was shopping for churches, and of course I was a church planner, so I wanted to convince him to come to mine. And he said, I can't go to your church, Aaron. And I said, why not? And he said, I was looking around, and I decided I felt called to this church. And I said, why would you go there? There's not a single person your age in that church. And he said, exactly. I felt like they needed me the most. At 25 years old, he was looking for a church, not that felt comfortable to him, but where he was going to die to himself the most and be the most useful and the greatest blessing to somebody else. It is not a surprise to me that a heart oriented like that is now one of the most significant leaders in this city. I wonder how that happened. As you come to him, you are being built like living stones. Not bricks, stones. And as we get built into this spiritual house, there's an interdependence on one another in order for the house to stand. There's an intergenerational interdependence. One of the reasons why you and I need to be in church on a Sunday morning 
is so that the vitality of youth and the wisdom of age can co-mingle because in God's grand design, the generations shape each other. Don't deprive yourself of that opportunity. There are brilliant people because of their hard life circumstances in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s who have so much to teach a young heart because they've experienced so much and they've seen God work in ways that you and I just haven't yet. I need them. You need them even if you don't even know it. It's part of God's brilliant design of calling us to gather as a church so that the generations can commingle together. And so that the diversity of gifts can be complementary of one another. To not put yourself in that place is to rob others of the gifts that God has put inside of you. And the opposite is also true. Don't rob them of the gifts in you. And don't rob yourself of the gifts that you could be experiencing because of the blessing of the people all around you who God just happened to design differently than you. There's a reason why you don't look like the person sitting next to you. Because God's a genius. He knows how to make you into a community by putting different people together. And sometimes that tension is what makes us grow the most. Sometimes we go to church and we're like, I didn't like this. I didn't like that. Sometimes it's in the not liking of stuff and the figuring that all out together. That's part of God's furnace of transformation, of iron sharpening iron, of us learning from one another, of us dying to ourselves, of us hearing another perspective, all sharing a commonality with one another in our faith. And that commonality, we have this weird Christian word for this, fellowship, koinonia. But make no mistake, koinonia is not just hanging out. It's not even just about gathering. Koinonia is a unique thing that God does when his people get together. Because it's not a sharing of affinity. It's not me and a bunch of other Vikings fans are all getting together so we can be sad together again this Sunday when we're disappointed. That's an affinity group. That is not koinonia fellowship. Fellowship is something entirely different where God is working and the collection of his people are met with the power of heaven to do something that can't be done in a chess club, a swimming team, or a Vikings support group. Now those things are great, but they can't bring about the transformation that a church can. They can't. They weren't designed to do it. It's not part of God's plan. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. All of this is being done with a purpose. And he gets to it later in the passage, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You ever wonder why the Bible says where two or three are gathered? And it doesn't say where one person is? It actually takes a multitude in order to create fellowship. You can't do it on your own. That's also part of God's design. It's not an accident. The church is God's appointed vehicle for the propagation of the gospel, for evangelizing the nations, for discipling the world, for transforming your heart, for growing you, for intergenerational relationships, for service to the world, for a multiplication of generosity, for a home and a hospital, for sinners, and for all those who are struggling It's a place where we go and we gather to carry one another's burdens and find peace and rest in the person of Christ through others who bear his image and are chasing after him in the same way that we are. All of these things are designed to work together. And when we don't, and when we aren't, we can't wonder why we're falling short. Listen to the plural language, and we'll close with this. I'll ask the band to come on up. And sing our last song and lead us. But listen to these words as they do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Can you hear the plural in this? Yes, you uniquely bear the image and the likeness of God. Yes, you and you alone are a treasured possession. But put together, now we can accomplish what God wanted to do in the world in a whole other way. You are God's special possession. That is what you are. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You know what the three first commands in the Bible are when God calls his people together? Celebrate. 
God described worship the first three times in the Bible where God's people are called together as celebration. Celebrate when we get together in this place. Celebrate and remind one another. The center of our story is a resurrection. At the center of our story is a king who reigns on high. That no matter what's happening in my world around me, I stand on solid ground. That's the gift I get to experience. And when I can sing that out and declare it out and stand shoulder to shoulder with my brother and sister in Christ, that is supposed to be an amazing feeling. And if it's not right now, I am so excited at your generation and what you guys are going to do with the church when it's in your hands. Do not be discouraged. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Keep doing and keep putting yourself in the places of growth. God is refining your hearts. God is shaping you. God's church will not fail. His promises will not be broken. The ends of the earth will be reached. And you will be part of it. To your neighbor, to the people on the other side of your state, and to the people on the other side of your globe. Our God is so good. He calls us people together. You were made to belong within a church. Amen. Guys, um, stand in response to that. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil our domain. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. church we need your power we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your joy and prize to see Captive hearts release the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this. Your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets, and land. Set your church on fire when these nations back. Change the Show you.
Friends, go back out into your day and enjoy studying to be lawyers, teachers, nurses, engineers, physical therapists. One day, we could go on for a while. But hear this. Before you were ever any one of those things, you, my friends, are an ambassador of heaven itself. Give him heaven today. Go in peace. Amen.